So, in this module, uh, we are going to discuss the fundamentals of pipelining. And we find pipelining applications in many scenarios in our real life. We will consider one example. So, for example, consider the admissions in an engineering college or an university. This consists of uh, the set of steps a student has to go through uh, for taking up a seat in the university or the college. So, first he has to uh, go for uh, verification of medical records through a doctor. Next, the student has to go to a person uh, who will verify the certificates and finally, once the seat is allotted, uh, the student has to uh, go to a person to pay the fee. So, effectively in this process, we can see a student will go through different stages before uh, paying the fee. And now, while a doctor is busy with verifying medical records of a student, the person who is verifying the original records, original certificates will be free and similarly, the person who is collecting the fee also will be free. So, now, if at any point of time only one student is taking the services of all these three people, so overall the efficiency will not be there. So, overall efficiency will be significantly degraded. So, rather because these three persons are doing three different tasks, so what we can do is while one student is uh, consulting a doctor for uh, a medical record checking, the other student can go to the person who is verifying the certificates and similarly the third student can go to a person who is collecting the uh, fee. So, in other words, while the first student is busy with the payment of fee, the second student will be busy with uh, the certificate verification, the third student or the new student who is entering the queue will be busy with uh, the medical record verification. Let us assume that each of these tasks will take uh, x amount of time and uh, the first student will complete his task after 3 x amount of time, but after that every x units of time one student will complete his task because all these three tasks are independent and then so as a result like uh, different students will be there in different phases of their admission process and the overall uh, the time it takes for uh, completing the admission process for uh, let us say 100 students will be significantly reduced. And the such type of applications we can find in real life scenarios plenty. So, effectively we can see pipelining applications everywhere and uh, as part of this computer architecture course, we are going to focus on pipelining of instruction execution. But in this particular module, we are going to see the, the basics of pipelining and then we will uh, illustrate this pipelining with an example by considering a combinational uh, circuit. So, a pipelining can be defined as a partitioning a system into multiple stages and each of these stages are separated by a set of buffers. So, that means like uh, between two uh, stages we will put a buffer and that buffer is going to store the, the computations whatever is done by the previous stage. So, effectively if I divide my overall computation into n stages, so I will consider n buffers intermediate to each of these uh, the pair of uh, the stages and uh, they store the intermediate uh, computed values. So, once we have this uh, process of dividing a system into smaller pieces, so that multiple independent computations can be processed through these different stages and as a result the performance can be improved. Performance improvement we get through pipelining is proportional to the depth of a pipeline. If I divide a computation into n tasks, in an ideal scenario I can get a performance improvement of n times. And this performance is actually we can also represent it using the throughput and uh, the pipelining will uh, improve the throughput of a system. So, consider an example here, let us assume that we have a, com a combinational circuit which takes n gate delays. Uh, to compute a task. So, here given an input to the combinational circuit, uh, 
it takes n gate delays to produce the output. Now, if this entire combinational circuit is not partitioned, then effectively uh, we will process the given inputs for every n gate delays. So, in other words, we will get a bandwidth of 1 by n. So, here one computation will be completed for every n gate delays. Now, if I want to partition this combinational logic into two pieces in an ideal scenario, each piece is going to take uh, n by 2 gate delays and uh, since I partitioned the combinational logic into two parts and I separated these two parts by using uh, uh, latch. And so, the first part half of the computation will take n by 2 gate delays and after n by 2 gate delays, then I will get the partial output and when we apply a clock, then uh, so this will be latched in the intermediate uh, buffer and once the data is stored in the intermediate buffer, then this will be taken as an input to the second stage of uh, the computation and which takes another n by 2 gate delays and we will get the output at the end of n gate delays with added latency of uh, the propagation delay through the latches. So, here each of these latches have uh, the clock. So, effectively we latch the input, we latch the output from the previous stage only at a particular uh, clock pulse and once it is latched then we can use this as an input to the next stage and uh, this will continue. So, as a result once we have two stages separated by a latch, so while the second stage is taking the input from the latch, the first stage can work with new set of inputs and uh, the first stage output will be returned to the latch only at a regular clock pulse and that we need to uh, determine based on the computational delay required for uh, each of these individual stages. So, now once we divide this computation into two parts, our bandwidth will be effectively 2 by n because we will get the output at every n by 2 gate delays except the first one. The first one is going to take uh, uh, n gate delays excluding the delay through the latch but after that every n by 2 gate delays will get the next output. So, effectively our bandwidth will be uh, 2 by n. So, in other words in n gate delays we are going to compute the two inputs. And now if I continue the logic again for example, divide this combinational uh, uh, logic into three parts by considering three stages and uh, each adjacent stages are separated by a latch. Now, each of this sub stage is going to take n by 3 gate delays and effectively our bandwidth will be 3 by n. In other words, if I divide my combinational logic into k stages, I can get a bandwidth of k by n. In other words, the bandwidth will be improved by k times. So, potential k fold increase in throughput is obtained with a k stage pipeline. Again, this is an ideal scenario where we will get this k fold increase, but in reality uh, we may not get this k fold increase. So, now having discussed this, so one can say that ok, I will just go for any k so that I can improve uh, uh, the throughput significantly. If you consider k very large, then you can get a significant improvement according to this statement but in reality that is not the case. So, there are several factors impact the number of pipeline stages or the depth of the pipeline. So, the major constraints which limit the number of pipeline stages or the depth of pipeline is the clocking constraints. So, let us assume that we have a combinational part which is denoted as f and uh, the set of latches denoted by l. And now this combinational logic will take some amount of time for processing the inputs. And since the combinational logic uh, can have multiple paths from input to output, so as a result, so we need to consider two timing parameters. One is the T capital M which is the maximum propagation delay through uh, the combinational logic F and there is another one T small m 
which is the minimum propagation delay through the combinational logic. And since we also considered latches which are separating the adjacent stages of the pipeline and it takes T L amount of time. The T L amount of time is uh, needed for uh, proper clocking because the latch requires the setup and the hold times and so on. So, effectively, so given an input, the input will take either T small m or T capital M amount of time uh, to reach the output from the inputs and it requires another T L amount of time to be latched properly in the, the buffer or pipeline register. Now, assume that we are planning to give inputs to this combination logic at T1 and T2 and these are the, the timings at which we want to apply the pipeline uh, the clock. So, T1, T2 represent the time at which the first and the second set of signals applied to the inputs of F. Now, once we have mentioned T1, T2 and also we have T capital M, T small m and T L, we will give an equation inequality which is T2 plus T small m should be greater than a T1 plus T capital M plus T L. This indicates that the second set of inputs can be given to this combinational logic or a pipeline uh, logic at, at a time which should be greater than the time at which the first signal is given plus the time it takes for processing the first set of inputs, the maximum time it takes for the first set of inputs to reach the output plus the time it takes for proper latching minus the minimum amount of time the second set of inputs will go from input to the output. In other words, T2 plus T small m should be greater than T1 plus T capital M plus TL. So, T2 plus TM actually represents the time at which the second set of inputs are applied to the uh, combinational logic and the minimum amount of time these inputs take to reach from the input to the output and T1 plus T capital M indicates the time at which the first set of inputs applied to the combinational logic and uh, the maximum amount of time these inputs are taken to reach from input to the output. And once the inputs are processed by the combinational logic and these outputs have to be stored properly in the latch, so that is going to take uh, T L amount of time. So, if we rearrange this inequality, we will get T 2 minus T 1 is the interval between the first set of signals applied to the combinational logic and the second set of uh, the inputs applied. In other words, the clocking time between uh, two sets of inputs applied to the pipeline uh, 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 of pipelining of this combinational logic which is greater than T capital M minus T small m plus T L. In other words, we have to apply clocking such a way that it should be greater than the difference between our maximum time and the minimum time for inputs to be processed by the uh, combinational logic plus the time it takes for proper latching. And again like uh, if we design our combinational logic in a proper way such that all the paths critical paths are of equal length. If we make that way then T capital M is almost equal to T small m. Once we have the input to the output path length is same even if there are n number of paths from input to outputs and if we make the length of all these paths equal then our maximum propagation time and the minimum propagation time will be almost same. So, as a result our T 2 minus T 1 will be greater than just T L. In other words, our depth of the pipeline is determined by the T L. The minimum time required for latching and the clock skew limit the depth of the pipeline. Here the clock skew is because when we are dealing with the synchronous circuits 
So, all the components in the synchronous circuit will work synchronously by using a clock. So, there is a clock which generates these clock signals and these clock signals may reach different components at different times. There may be a slight variation and that variation is called as a clock skew. So, effectively our number of pipeline stages is determined by this clocking constraints. So, once we have this then we can clearly see that we can divide our combinational logic to a maximum number of pipeline stages by satisfying this clocking constraint. As long as we take care of TL and uh, the clock skew, we can divide our uh, combinational logic into n number of uh, pipeline stages. And this foil is actually determining the maximum number of pipeline stages that we can come up with for a given combinational logic or combinational uh, uh, circuit uh, computation. But again not always this maximum number of pipeline stages is optimal. So, when I say optimal, so depending on the requirements our optimality is determined. So, we will consider optimal pipeline depth by considering the cost as well as the performance. Let us assume that G be the, the cost of a non-pipeline a design and T be the latency of a non pipeline design. And uh, since we are planning to make this design into a pipeline design, so we will need to consider set of latches and the cost and the latency associated with the latches are determined by L and S. So, the cost of a K stage pipeline design is G plus K L because we know that once we divide our non pipeline combinational circuit into a pipeline uh, design uh, by dividing that into k stages. So, we need to consider k latches. So, effectively our uh, overall cost associated with our earlier non pipeline design is increased by k into L. So, effectively the total cost associated with this k stage pipeline is G plus K L where G is the cost associated with the non pipeline design and K is the number of stages and each stage we require a latch and L is the cost associated with the latch. And this cost can be defined as the area it takes. Okay. And now we will now look at the latency point. So, we know that a non pipeline design is going to take uh, a latency of T, but once we consider a pipeline design and that to k stages. So, our overall latency is decreased significantly and that is represented by uh, T by k plus s because we divided our non pipeline design into k stages. So, each stage is ideally going to take T by k amount of time and uh, there is some latency associated with the uh, propagation delay of the latch that is rep represented by S. So, effectively for each stage our latency is now T by K plus S. So, in summary once we divide a non pipeline design into K stage pipeline then we are we have uh, we incur a cost of G plus K L, but the latency is reduced to uh, T by K plus S. Let the performance be defined as uh, 1 by latency. Now, we want to see whether uh, we want to see how many pipeline stages are required if our design is optimal in terms of cost per performance. So, cost per performance is uh, cost into latency according to the above uh, equation. So, effectively uh, we will have uh, the overall expression becomes a gs plus lt plus k into ls plus gt by k and now we want to find the optimal number of pipeline stages uh, which minimizes our cost per performance we have to incur least cost at the same time we have to get maximum performance so effectively we take the first derivative of this expression and equate that to zero and the derivative with respect to k because we want to find uh, the number of uh, pipeline stages. Once we do that, then we get uh, k optimal equal to a square root of g t by l s. So, in other words for a given combinational circuit which 
has a cost of g and the latency of t and the latch cost is l and the latch latency is uh, s then we can come up with the optimal number of pipeline stages for that combinational circuit by considering square root of gt by ls number of uh, stages. So, this indicates that given a combinational circuit if we want to optimize the design for cost per performance then we cannot divide that combinational circuit by not more than square root of gt by ls number of uh, pipeline stages. So, having discussed this now we will consider an example of uh, a floating point multiplier and this example is taken from a research paper uh, published by Wesser and Flynn in 1982. So, here we are considering a fixed point uh, a multiplier for floating point numbers and we know that the floating point numbers have uh, uh, sine bit uh, exponent and the mantissa. Of course, the example here the authors considered are not following the IEEE standard and as a result we have a mantis of 56 bits with a hidden bit and 8 bits of exponent. So, we are considering a biased 128 exponent and a sine bit and uh, given two floating point numbers when we are multiplying the sign will be determined by XR of the two numbers and uh, that will be obtained in S3 which is going to give the resultant sign of this multipli uh, multiplication and we have exponents E1 and E2 and we need to perform the addition because we are performing a multiplication of two floating point numbers. So, we will just add uh, the corresponding uh, the exponents and uh, in the case of Mantissa we use a fixed point uh, Mantissa multiplier logic and which actually consists of uh, the partial product generations and then we add these partial products. So, that is represented as partial product uh, uh, reduction and finally, once we have we keep on adding this the partial uh, products to get the intermediate results and finally, we end up with two partial products and uh, we just add that uh, by using uh, carry look ahead uh, adder and finally, we get the, the actual uh, the value and once we have the value then we need to normalize that and also we may need to perform a rounding. So, effectively to perform this uh, floating point multiplication of two floating point numbers and uh, the authors observed that these are the the total amount of time it takes for each of these components 125 nanoseconds for partial product generation, 150 nanoseconds for uh, partial product uh, reduction, 55 nanoseconds for final reduction and 20 nanoseconds for normalization of the result, 50 nanoseconds for uh, rounding off and the overall latency it takes is 400 nanoseconds for uh, performing a multiplication of two floating point numbers. So, effectively if you do not uh, if you are not going to go for uh, pipeline design we can perform a multiplication on two floating point numbers with a latency of 400 nanoseconds a delay of 400 nanoseconds. So, if you want to pipeline this design then uh, how the performance is improved that we are going to see now. So, we know that the multiplication part the multiplication of uh, this Mantissa components consists of uh, uh, three portions one is the partial product generation, partial product reduction and the final reduction and each is taking uh, 125 nanoseconds, 150 nanoseconds and 55 nanoseconds respectively. And uh, the next one is the normalization which is going to take uh, 20 nanoseconds and rounding is going to take 50 nanoseconds. Now, given this uh, delay values for each of these components, we can divide our uh, uh, total floating point multiplication process into a different number of stages, but this particular uh, uh, division is optimal. The reason is here you can see the first stage is going to take 125 nanoseconds because add or subtract is going to take less amount of time than the partial product generation. So, as a result uh, when we decide a pipeline stage we have to consider a stage the component in that pipeline stage which is going to take the maximum uh, 
delay. So, in this particular case, uh, partial product generation is going to take uh, more time. So, we are going to consider 125 nanoseconds for this. And now, the second stage you can see the partial product reduction which takes 150 nanoseconds. We cannot combine the generation and the reduction into a single stage. If we combine these, then effectively our overall uh, uh, delay for that stage is going to be uh, 275 nanoseconds, which is not optimal. And similarly, the last three components are put together are considered as a single stage, which is going to take uh, 125 nanoseconds. In other words, when we divide this floating point multiplication uh, computation into three stages, the first one is going to take 125 nanoseconds, the second one is taking 150, third one is taking 125 nanoseconds. And now, once we have these three divisions, the three stages when we divided the uh, non-pipeline floating point computation, we have to decide the, the pipeline cycle time. And whenever we divide any computation into different stages in a pipeline, the pipeline stage latency or the delay is determined by the maximum delay of any of the stages. Here in this particular case, two stages are taking 125 nanoseconds and one stage is taking uh, 150 nanoseconds. Effectively, the middle stage is actually determining the overall pipeline stage cycle time and which is 150 nanoseconds plus because we are separating stages by using uh, pipeline registers or latches and we need to consider the latency associated with that latch also. In this particular case, we consider 17 nanoseconds for processing, for storing the data in the uh, pipeline uh, uh, latch or pipeline register and 5 nanoseconds for setup time. Effectively, 22 nanoseconds is the overhead we get, overhead we incur because of this uh, pipeline registers. In other words, the R pipeline stage time or pipeline stage delay is equal to the delay associated with the stage computation plus delay associated with the pipeline registers. In other words, in this particular example, we get a pipeline stage delay of 172 nanoseconds. So, once we have this pipeline uh, design for our floating point multiplication, after the first computation is done, if you are supplying the inputs to this floating point multiplier continuously, we can get the outputs at every 172 nanoseconds as compared to a 400 nanoseconds that we incur in the non-pipeline design. So, as a result, we can easily see that this pipeline design of floating point multiplier is going to improve the throughput by 2.3 times, which is nothing but 400 by 172. And remember, the pipelining is going to improve the throughput overall throughput of the system. As long as we supply the inputs to the, the pipeline unit continuously. But if you are supplying only one pair of inputs to this floating point multiplier, the actual latency it takes to compute the output is actually 516 nanoseconds as compared to a 400 nanoseconds in the case of non-pipeline design. So, as a result, so, if you are performing a single computation, then pipelining may not be efficient. So, which actually incurs extra latency because of this uh, the pipeline registers. But again, when we are designing a pipeline, uh, uh, when we are considering a pipeline design for a computation, our assumption is we are going to use that pipeline design for processing large collection of inputs. So, that is uh, the reason why pipelining is going to improve the throughput significantly. So, with that I am concluding this module and in the next module I am going to discuss the instruction pipelining. Thank you.